excited. All right, thanks everyone for coming out here today. Um, seems like we have like three people here, and I've over twice that, so awesome. Um, anyway, just a little bit about myself. My name is Brandon Dayton. Um, I'm, a, I'm a comic artist currently. Uh, worked in video games, worked in video games for about seven years as a, as a game artist. Um, but I've, I've basically always uh, been a, an artist. Wanted to be an artist uh, for most of my life. I was in bands. I, I made short films. I did animation. I just kind of just kind of tried everything at some point. I've also had kind of a um, uh, uh, a little bit of history with religion and spirituality. Um, you know, I was I was raised LDS Mormon. Even though I'm not a member of that faith anymore, um, it still you know affects who I am. And I've been a, a dedicated. Um, meditator like for the last uh, 12 years. So I thought a lot about spirituality and I thought a lot about religion and this is me just kind of thinking a little bit about how those those two things go together. Uh, the other thing you, you could probably, um, other way you could probably label this discussion today would be um, how to be an artist. This is about I, kind of my ideas about what it means to be an artist and also like how to start your art cult. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about making art, I'm going to talk about community, and I'm going to talk about place. I wanted to start with this quote by Bhikkhu Bodhi. He was a, uh, a Buddhist monk and scholar. Um, he says this, a spiritual tradition is not a shallow stream in which one can wet one's feet and then beat a quick retreat to the shore. It is a mighty, tumultuous river which would rush through the entire landscape of one's life. And if one truly wishes to travel on it, one must be courageous enough to launch one's boat and head out for the depths. So um, one thing that I've kind of taken me a long time to learn is that if you really want to you know, dedicate your life to art, it does take like a little bit of sacrifice. It does take kind of jumping in and, and doing something a little bit different. Um, but I kind of started out by wetting my feet. This is a picture of me wetting my feet. This is me about 15 years ago. I just finished film school. This is my, my first home I'm posing in front of here. It's a town home in a suburb in West Jordan, Utah. Um, I started my first art job. I was happy. I was actually working in art, even though I wasn't, wasn't making a ton. Um, I, uh, you know, bought a car. I was about to start a family. But I was also in this time of life. I was pretty miserable. Um, like I, I wanted to be an artist, and I was trying to figure out how to start my art career and how to how to get it going. Um, but I was also kind of just upset that like uh, I feel like I'm, I'm just gonna be stuck in this like little town home the rest of my life and, and wishing I had like a bigger house and all this stuff. And I, I kind of didn't have kind of a misunderstanding, I think, at this point in my life uh, about what it means to be an artist. Um, and I ended up running into some good stuff that really helped me kind of sort this out. I had a good therapist, but I also read Jack Kornfield's book, Path of, uh, Path of Heart, um, and Stephen Pressfield's um, The War of Art. And the, the thing that I, I realized from, from reading those books was um, this, art is spiritual. Um, and it's something I've been trying to like uh, integrate into my life for the last last 15 years. And this is a very broad term, so I'm going to try to like define what it means like spiritual as far as my definitions go. Um, you know, first of all, there's this idea that art, art is worth making for for art's sake. I think any of us that want to be artists, you know, we do it just because it gives our lives a certain sense of meaning. We we have a certain sense of purpose and a sense of like of pride, like having created something of value. So there's that idea too, but I also want to talk about art as like this this broader like communal thing that's important to, to the community, um, and that's because there's kind of this fundamental human problem, and that's how we deal with um, the unknown. So there's this there's this kind of issue of being a human where it's like we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or next year or a few years, and so we we try to figure out like okay what's the best way to deal with the fact that we don't know what's coming next. And we have kind of two ways we deal with this. Um, and this kind of breaks up into the two kind of jobs that people do. Um, one way we do this is by saying, okay, here's what worked yesterday. So we're gonna kind of keep doing what worked yesterday and kind of keep moving forward. And the other one is to say, we don't know what's gonna happen next. This happened yesterday, but that may not happen tomorrow. So we kind of need to explore and try out some different things. And so we can break these up into kind of two categories. We have we have art, the spiritual stuff, and then we have um, materialistic, which is like stuff, which is things, the, the accumulation of things. And so art is kind of the exploratory um, way of trying to solve that problem of the unknown. We're, we're trying out a lot of different ideas, exploring things, not knowing what's gonna work, 
And the materialistic approach is basically saying like, okay, we know what's, what works, here's the things we, we know what to do, so let's just kind of keep doing them. You kind of break it down this way. Art is about exploring, materialism is about paying the bills, art is about innovation, materialism is about tradition, art you can think about as like patching the code, if you want to think about like programming, you know, and, and stuff's about running the build. Art is experimental, and uh, materialism is, is like, is proven. So, and you might you may notice just kind of seeing these things that there's some places in life where it's good to be experimental and try things and explore. There's some places where it's better to kind of have proven stuff. Like for for my diabetes, I don't want to take some experimental drug for it. I want to take something that that's proven. And there's a lot of, a lot of things like that. But there's other places where we need to have space to explore and try to try to figure out different ways to, to solve the problems in the world. Um, so anyway, this this is important to know because the world that we live in is primarily built around materialism. That's primarily the world we live in today is, is built from this box of materialism. And it's, um, there's kind of this idea that, that our culture creates reality. So we have this culture around of materialism and it creates a reality bubble or like a reality sphere that's like the materialism reality sphere where we see everything from within that, that prism. Um, and uh, the writer Yuval Harari has talked about this idea of like uh, shared fictions. So there's an idea that goes back to like when we were competing with other um, hominids, and the reason the Homo sapiens was were able to, to outcompete them were because we had these things called shared fictions, where there's these made-up things that we all agreed we pretended like they were real, and it gave us a lot of uh, power. Um, and so some examples of these are like money, uh, corporations, laws, titles. These can be like myths. So let me explain what that means when I say it's like a shared fiction. Like a, a, a money, like a dollar bill is a piece of paper. But like we all agree that it means something. And because we all agree it means something, it's, that's the reality. It, it does mean something. It does have a power. It's the same with a corporation or a law or like a title. Like we vote for president. Think about what that means to vote for president. We all get together and say this person is going to be in charge. Like nothing biologically has changed about that person. It's just that we all agree that they're president, that it suddenly becomes this like reality. So this is really important because we live in this, this reality bubble that's about materialism. And the problem is, as artists, when we try to fit into this reality bubble about materialism, there's a little bit of a, a tension. Um, so materialism is about a couple things. It's about stability and it's about predictability. And we kind of form our reality around those things. And it's, so it's very much about like accumulating things, like having, saving up stuff so we can prepare for, for tomorrow. So along with that comes this ideal of, uh, of stuff equaling status. Like it's, it's, stuff affects how people think of us, like having a nice house, having a nice car, how we dress, that all communicates how we want people to, to think about, about us. Um, the problem with that is that um, being an artist is fundamentally about um, failure. Um, this happens like at lots of levels. Like if you've had any experience being an artist, you, you probably know what this means. But you know, the, just pencil to the page, there's lots of failure to figure out how to make art. You know, with our careers, there's like, what's gonna work? Where should I go? What should I do? What type of work can I do? But also like on this really broad scale, like all of us as a civilization working together, um, you know, it's kind of dependent on lots of us failing for us to find those pieces of art that are going to do the stuff that we need it to do. Um, you can think about it like there's, there's like a couple of people like J.K. Rowling or like uh, George Lucas that are super successful. And there's a lot of people like me that are like making art um, and they're just kind of trying to get by. So it's kind of dependent on, on us having a lot of failure. Um, for us to find that stuff that really works. And even individually, for us to like just make work that we're proud of, it take, takes a lot of failure. Um, all right, so here's a graph, and I know artists love graphs. But this is like, this is the secret, and this is the secret to, be, to being an artist and being successful as an artist. So this is from Nassim Taleb's book, um, Anti-Fragile. And it's, it looks complicated, but it's actually super, super simple. Um, and what it basically says, you have, you have like variable here, and variables all the crazy stuff that can happen to you in the course of your life. You know, good stuff can happen to you, bad stuff can happen to you, and then you have this other one that's like pain and gain, gains and losses. And I can't, can you see there's the line, a little dividing line? I can't really see the dividing line there, but anyway. So good stuff happens, 
and you get this big arc up here, and this could go like hyperbolic up into infinity. So you get a big payoff from being an artist. I mean, it is potential that you could hit a, hit a, hit a big, you know, fame and riches, whatever, but also there's this potential that, hey, you can make something that's really meaningful and, and valuable to you and to other people. This pain down here, this is when things don't go well. And what's important about pain, to point out here, is there's kind of a bottom to it. It kind of levels out, you know? And so that's where we want to be as artists. We want to live our lives in such a way that when things go bad, there's a basement to it. You know, we know what the, what the worst case scenario is, and we can be like, okay, I, I can live with the worst case scenario. If you can learn to live with the worst case scenario, you're in a really good position. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that affects our choices of how we live as an artist. But the problem is, as artists, when we try to live in this materialistic world, this chart looks a little bit different. It looks like this. So it's kind of the opposite. So, um, you know, we've got pain and gain. When things go wrong, things go really wrong. And they can be kind of catastrophic. Um, but when things go well, there's kind of a ceiling to it. Do you guys want to know what that ceiling is called in the materialistic world? It's called a salary. Like a salary is you're never going to get more than your, your salary. Um, but, you know, if we care about status and things like that and having stuff and we're trying to live a life full of failure, it can be really painful. And so there's this big problem when we try to teach, treat being an artist like being a dentist or an accountant or some other kind of stable job that we expect to have some sort of stable salary because it's just not meant to function within that world. Um, so you, you've probably um, gleaned the part of this is about like money and how we live and lifestyle. Like as an artist, we got to think really carefully about like where we where we spend our money because you want to be able to live a, a a life as simple as possible. You want that that pain that pain level to be be very comfortable, not having very much, so you can afford to have the freedom to, to fail. So it's important to think about like okay, what do we use money for? You know, needs for pleasure. Uh, for, you know, you can call that fun, pleasure you can call fun, and for status. You know, we like, we like this, other people to see the stuff that we have. And if anyone has had that experience of it, explaining to your parents that you want to become an artist, you've kind of seen that at work, where they said, like, I'm really concerned about you being an artist. And, you know, on the surface it looks like they're concerned about you not making a living, but it's really about them not wanting to tell their friends that you're going to be an artist, that their child is an artist, and he's not going to have money. But I think, I think this chart probably more accurately looks like this. Um, and I actually think it looks more like this. That this whole thing of status plays a much bigger role into our, how we spend money than we think. Um, it's something that took me a long time to tease out really how much like, I cared about the stuff that I had and how much that, how would, that would affect how people think about me. And something that's, that still affects me. And again, that's because we live in this reality bubble of materialism that tells us that, that that's something that's important. Um, so the trick is, as artists, we want to simplify this. We want as much as possible. We want to take away this thing where money equals status or where things equal status. And look what happens when you take that away. You get like this little paper airplane. That's this little paper airplane of freedom, of being an artist. If you can just focus on the stuff you really need in life and a little bit of fun, then that can give you the freedom um, to be an artist. So, um, I want to kind of make a suggestion here that the way we do this is something kind of a little bit unusual. I think a lot of times when we think about being an artist, we think about, what can I do to be an artist? Like, what skills can I learn? You know, what, what things do I need to accomplish? Uh, stuff like that. But I think more importantly, we need to think about, like, what people do we need to be with? Like, that's the most important question. And we need to think about, like, building communities that support um, our values and artists. And I think that we can um, learn from past spiritual communities and gain some insights on how to do this. So I'm going to make a, a kind of wild suggestion here. I think artists should be a little bit more like monks. So I can tell you're all really excited about this idea. But let me explain it a little bit further, and then I'll show you some examples that may make you feel a little more comfortable with this. But the thing about, about like these monastic orders back in the day where they were solving the same exact problem. They had things that were more important to them than materialism. They were, they were interested in spiritual stuff, so they had to separate themselves from the rest of society so they could focus on that, on the stuff that mattered to them. What they did is they created their own reality bubble. They said, this, these are the things that matter within our, our reality. And they built a community that supported that reality. 
and it empowered individuals to, to live that, that spiritual life. Um, here's another picture of some monks. These are some Thai, Thai forest monks going out to, to collect alms. Um, and what's really important about this is um, there's also this like sustainability factor of it. You know, we talked about this like wanting to be comfortable in the low end of this curve. You know, these monks, they own like three, three or four possessions. They have like robes and a bowl and, and something else. And so they have very low like, very low um, cost of living, right? And you know, we don't have to go to these extremes, even though it'd be really interesting to see what, how that would happen, but they could go on doing this forever. Like, they are not going to have some sort of economic crisis and have some sort of crash. You know, they're not paying for boardrooms and, you know, gym memberships and stuff like that. They live, they live pretty simply. So, it's important to think about, like, how, how can we kind of take things more at that level where we live things a little bit less materialistically. Um, and so there's a word for this. When we say we're going to put spirituality before materialism, that's called, like, renunciation. Um, and like I said, we don't have to go to the extremes of actually shaving our heads and giving away all possessions and, and walking around in robes. I think it's just as simple as, as, as saying this, that we're going to put art first in our life. So, you know, money still matters. We still have to worry about material things. And I'm, I'm a father and a husband. I have a family I have to take care of. Um, but I have to think about, like, how can I make art a priority? How can I make sure the art is something that, that is, is always part of my life? Um, and so I think what I kind of want to suggest is that like we want to try to create communities and find communities that are kind of like these old spiritual communities in the sense that they put art first. That they say that we have to make sure that there's a priority for art in some way. So I want to talk just a little bit about what that might look like and um, some of the communities I'm a part of. Here's a good, good quote from Walt Disney on the subject. It says, we don't make movies to make money, we make money to make movies. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm a member of a couple of artistic communities. Um, this one is called uh, the Film Foundry, uh, part of the Utah Film Center. Uh, it's basically like a shared studio space for filmmakers, um, and there's a couple of, of artists and writers that also participate. Um, I'm also a member of a weekly uh, drawing group called Draw Night. Um, but I also want to use some examples of um, the Van Guard. They're, they formed out of a collective called the Slave Pit. And so I want to make sure and, and show them as an example because they're a good, a good counterpoint to this whole like monastic thing I just talked about. So you don't get too caught up in the idea that it means you have to live this kind of puritanical life um, without any fun. Uh, but communities have a couple of, of components to them that make them strong, that allow them to kind of support the individual in it kind of empowering themselves through, through art. They have kind of shared values, and that shared value can be like just saying like we put art first. They all have myth, um, and they, they have rituals. So um, myth is just really basically this idea of saying like we believe this because. We believe art this comes first because whatever reason you want to give because of that. And also having some stakes. So these spiritual communities, they're, they're pretty good at stakes because it's like, Damnation is the this, is this stake, or salvation is the stake. But as art communities, art communities need to think about, like, what are the stakes in, in, in your myth mythology? Like, what, what is, what's going to happen if you don't have that art community? What are you going to lose? Um, there's also ritual. So ritual is super important because it's not just about, you know, these weird things that religious people do together. Like, ritual is really about, like, tying people together with some sort of shared experience. But also, it's about having fun. So these are these are sh uh, shakers doing these these dances they would do these big concentric circle dances. So shakers were this totally celibate, um, utopian, 17th century uh, religious commune. Um, they also practice complete gender equity, though, in their in their organization, which is pretty interesting. But you know, they were known for making furniture and really living a really ascetic life. But you know, then they would get together and they would they would have these like crazy dance parties. So you know, for some of the ritual, it's really about like having something interesting and engaging and, and fun for the participants. And and as artists, this can, these rituals can take lots of different forms. I mean, I think um, obviously performance is a type of ritual, whether it's concerts, whether it's art shows. Um, you know. There's lots of things that can kind of fit in that format. I think things like staple are a type of ritual. It's this thing where lots of like-minded people get together with shared values of art first, and they, they kind of started create, creating this reality bubble where it's okay to be an artist. 
um, and maybe not spend a ton of money um, doing it. Um, with the art communities that I, I participate in, um, some of the rituals we have are like, you know, at our house, we just have different programming that we do there. So it's not anything really complicated, but there are workshops, um, there are kind of Q&As we do with directors, there's, there's um, we have these things where artists come and, and kind of present the work that they've written, they do kind of readings of their work, and it's just a way for people to have shared experiences um, and to kind of create that sense of like, it's, it's okay, to, okay to be an artist. Um, Let's see, the other thing that's super important about communities that people don't often think about is, is cost. Um, so, cost can take a couple forms. It can be like an explicit cost, like you have to pay to be a part of a community. And if, if you have had any experience being part of a religious community, like the idea of like a tithe, or even any a, 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 another or, a, other types of organizations, like having some sort of due that you pay. So it can be something you pay, it can be this renunciation of like, hey, we're all giving up something to be part of this community. But uh, it can also be this uh, implicit cost of kind of your commitment to your, to your values. Um, like demonstrating that with the work you do. And it, it kind of has two like really important functions that it plays having this cost. And part part of my French here, but it's a little bit of a bullshit filter. So like Avic Art House, there's there's like a $50 fee a month to be a part of Avic Art House, which is like a, a really good deal for a, a co-working space in a city. Um, but it's, Everyone in there is like actually makes stuff. So all the people that actually care about making art are gonna are gonna be willing to pay a little bit of price to do it. And everyone that's just kind of talk is not gonna be willing to pay that price. It also prevents freeloaders. I mean, being part of a community, there's a lot of like value you get from being part of a community. You want to make sure that the people that are part of that community are actually like contributing to the community. So just by having like some type of cost, whatever type of cost that is. Um, that, that can really help that. And that's something like sociologists have, have looked at a lot, with a lot of like the most um, like successful groups, they like have some sort of really high cost uh, uh, to participation. Um, okay, and this all comes together to create this really important thing um, called bonding capital. Um, and so there's this reality tunnel thing that it's really important that you get artists together and they, you create the shared reality where it's okay to be an artist and it's okay not to have a lot of stuff. The other really powerful thing about it is you get this kind of collective action. Now you have this group, and now you can do things together. You can do stuff together that you could never do as an individual. Um, you can collaborate. Uh, you can also kind of go out and kind of resist against forces that may want to push against what you guys want as a community. Um, you know, and if all that happens, then you get like this really awesome, you know, artist community that where it feels good to be an artist. Um, so this leaves us with a really important question that I don't think we really spend enough time thinking about, and that's like, where's this stuff going to happen? And I think uh, a lot of the discussion and thought about art and community and networking over the last 15 years has really focused on the internet, and which I think can really be a really powerful resource, but we need to think about like um, places and having communities in real places. So what type of places are the right fit for art communities? Um, well, I, I think I have a good idea what places are not the right fit. I don't think this is this is where our communities are going to thrive, even though it's a fantastic place to raise a family, maybe. Um, and there's this quote from the slave pit, from one of the members of the slave pit from Guar, that I think sums up uh, what places are best for these communities to form. He said, um, it wouldn't have happened, saying slave pit and Guar, if Richmond didn't have urban decay. Um, so this is more likely the type of places where um, art communities are, are likely to form. So this is called the Richmond Dairy. This is a, a place back, back in the 70s, 80s that was in an area of, of urban blight, high crime, and it was just this abandoned dairy where a bunch of like hippies and um, you know, punk rockers and, and artists all hung out together. And you look around the world, you look kind of the history of kind of art collectives, they, they tend to form in kind of these urban areas. Um, and that's because urban areas, at least like theoretically, because of how they're built, should be cheaper places to live than out in the suburbs. Um, that's because it kind of because of two things. A, like if you're in a good good uh, urban area, you don't really have to have a car, and cars are like more expensive than people realize. But also, there's this idea of like public good over private luxury. If you're in an urban area, you don't have to have a fancy house because the urban area itself is going to provide a lot of the good. 
A good example of this is like my family and I visited Paris like a couple years ago, and we were like in this tiny Airbnb that had like warped floors and no air conditioning, and it was super noisy. But like we could walk out the door, and there's like the subway. We could go all over the city. There's these bakeries. There's comic book shops everywhere. So when you're in an urban setting, it's more about the stuff that's outside your door than the stuff that's in, 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 in your door. So again, you also have this thing where you don't, you're not spending a lot of money on luxury and stuff because all the best stuff in your life, all the quality of life is, is outside of the public space. Um, but it also is good because it has this other thing called bridging capital. So you have bonding capital that brings groups together but cities are really, really good at bridging capital. And bridging capital is basically where you have different groups that are like interacting with each other in ways that they wouldn't have otherwise otherwise done. And in the case of Guar, this is also kind of how, how Guar uh, ended up forming within the Richmond Dairy. You had these two groups. You had Dave Brocky, who had this punk band called Death Piggy. And you had Hunter Jackson, who was trying to create this uh, low budget sci-fi film called Slum Dogs from Outer Space. They were both hanging out in the Richmond Dairy. They ran into each other, and Dave Brocky said, hey, can I like borrow some of your props from this low-budget thing you're doing? So we're going to do this joke and just like dress up like these, these space aliens before our show. And that actually is what um, became Guar. So, um, and this is something that lots of economists and urbanists have thought, talked about, like Edward Glazer, Jane Jacobs have all, have all talked about how like the city is the place where all these kind of happy act accidents happen. You have these different overlapping communities that run into each other and, and end up innovating. So um, I'm a big fan of the city. I think that's like really where artists should be. And I think that's where those communities are going to form. But there's a problem with that. Um, and that's like kind of nowadays, uh, as many of you have probably noticed, I'm sure Austin is, is probably having some of these issues too. It's starting to get really expensive to, to live in the city. Um, where I'm at in Salt Lake City, that's starting to be a problem too. It's hard to be an artist in the city. So um, I think we really got to think about like where are the places where, where this is really going to happen in the future. Um, I think this is, this is kind of more likely what those places are going to look like. Like mid-sized cities that have some sort of walkable core to them where you don't have to have a car. Um, where like you could live there and you could walk over there to your studio space or it could be, all be in the same building or something like that. Um, I think a lot of these old like Rust Belt cities, I think, are really interesting areas of opportunity, um, kind of the places people aren't really looking at. You know, if a, if a city is a place where you really want to live it, live in, um, it's probably going to be a lot of competition to be there, and there's not going to be as much opportunity uh, to be there. I've actually followed like history of Buffalo pretty carefully too. Buffalo, New York, I've had some family that live there, and you know, they're they're one of these former Rust Belt cities. It's not a place that people are like rushing to live in. And so, as a city, they're willing to make all these sorts of innovations, all these concessions um, to artists and innovators and people that want to make a difference and, and try new things. Um, so I think it, it's interesting just to kind of look at those places where everyone's not focusing, the, the less, the less uh, interesting places, you could say. Um, but anyway, I kind of wanted to end with this, this quote. This is from the, the Slate Pits website. Um, just again, talking about real, reality and what we want as artists. It says, but what the hell is the slave pit? It started as a physical place, but was always an idea. So what is that idea? That reality is something that we build. And so, you know, what I feel like I'm trying to learn a little by little over time, what I'd like to leave today is that like, if we want um, to be artists, if we want to have a life that is focused on art and that empowers us, we have to be willing to make those sacrifices and to kind of jump into that river to, to build the reality that we want. So um, I'm gonna leave with that. Uh, I'm also gonna, I was planning on doing like a drawing demonstration after this, but if you guys want to do a few questions before that, we can also do that, so it's, it's up to you. What big projects have you contributed to? What big projects have I contributed to? Uh, okay, the, probably the biggest thing I've ever worked on is Disney Infinity. So I was at, at um, Disney Interactive for about three years, and I was, I was part of that. Um, the, the thing that's biggest to me, that's most important to me, uh, is a couple of comic books uh, called Green Monk that are my own kind of passion projects, and you can come check those out. I've got them, you know, on my table outside. So, yeah. any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. So you mentioned as an artist, um, you have to have a lot of failure. So how do you measure success through failure? Uh, how, do you, how do you measure success through failure? 
I mean, I think you definitely can do that. I mean, there is this idea that the best artists are the ones that have failed the most. So you look at any artist that's really good at what they do, and you just know for certain that they've put more hours than the drawing table, you know, failing. Um, there is also this idea that, that likely someone that's successful, they've tried a lot more things, a lot more times, and they have to fail a lot kind of just, just to have that success. Um, but also I think we can measure success through failure just by looking at what type of culture we have. Do we have a culture that's okay with failure? You know, do we have a culture that like makes people feel bad about, <laughs> you know, failing or doesn't give them the space to try things over and over again? And I think if you look in our culture, for some reason, we're really okay with like entrepreneurs like failing, like that's part of our culture. Like Amazon can like be a company that's in debt and doesn't make a profit for 20 years and we're okay with that. But then the idea that someone isn't able to like make a living as an artist, like we, we stigmatize. So I think it's about making space for, um, you know, failure in our culture, yeah. Any other thoughts? I think that was well stated. I liked it, but I got nothing to add. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, any questions? I mean, I could I could talk a lot more about this stuff, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little drawing demonstration if you guys are into it. So it seems and it's kind of like a big like change from what I was just talking about. Uh, but um, you know, drawing itself can be a spiritual. If I can figure out how to get out of here, there you go. And it's too bad there aren't a lot of tables that you guys can like try try these exercises out on because it's really great to actually like to try them and to be able to, for me to be able to give feedback on them if, if you want to try to do them. But hey, I hit like right at that was actually exactly 30 minutes, so cool. I'm gonna move over here so I can use my uh, keyboard. Okay, so, um, you know, probably like a lot of people, I always wanted to, to be a, an artist. And I was always really frustrated, like, trying to find the right resources and trying to figure out where to start, how I learned to be an artist. Um, and so I, I always think back and I think, like, okay, if I were to do it now, if I were to start now, like, what stuff would I want to know that would help me make progress the fastest? Wrong stylus. Well, I guess I'm going to draw with my finger. See how that, see how that works. I can, I'll get, we'll get the same basic idea. It's hard mode. What's that? This hard mode, yeah. <laughs> okay, this could be new. I'll get the idea across. It's not going to be the most beautiful, but it'll, it'll, it'll still make sense. All right, so two things I always recommend people focus on uh, when, when learning to draw. Um, and I really, I, my focus is really on, on, on like draftsmanship, on like kind of the practice of drawing. Um, I'm not quite as good at like painting and, and coloring as, as other people are. So I kind of let people go other places if they really want to learn that stuff. So the first one is observational drawing. And observational drawing is just like, um, it's the most basic, obvious form of drawing. You look at something and you draw what you're looking at and you just want to really, really focus on making what you draw look like what you're, what you're trying to draw. So very simple, that one's very obvious. The other one that's, that's less obvious, and that, that one can take a lot of work. Um, and actually, like, I, even, I even think a subcategory of that is, is portraiture. Like portraiture is, is a really fantastic way to build that skill if you want to kind of build your observational abilities. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing I really recommend is, is learning construction. And learning construction is just basically learning how to draw simple shapes that then you can convert into more complex objects. And once you learn construction, you can kind of build anything out of, out of these objects. And I want to just show some simple exercises that I do to kind of build those construction skills. Just get a little water before, before I keep going. So the first one is literally drawing lines. And you've probably heard people say before, like, I can't even draw a straight line. 
Well, drawing straight lines actually turns out to be like one of the most challenging things to do, and it's, it's tough to do for, for lots of very experienced artists. So a lot of times when I start out these practices, what I'm literally doing is I'll just start out, I'll just have a page, and I'm just working on, sometimes I kind of ghost my finger back and forth, I'll think of like two points, and say like, can I even draw with my finger on this? It's going to be a little bit trickier than I thought. Brush. This may not let me draw with my finger. Oh, poop. That's no fun. How else can I show this? I should use like a camera right here where I can draw while I do that. Um, no. I don't think it's going to let me try to draw with my finger here. I wish I had another app that had, I could draw with my finger in. That would be nice. Right. Yeah. Anyone have any ideas? What, what, what can you draw with your finger in, in a lot of windows? Hmm. Okay. Maybe I'll just, I'm just going to do it on, on, on paper. Even if, except I don't have paper either. Is it a Wacom stylus? Yeah, but it's it's a it's a specialized one, and I brought the wrong okay. the wrong stylus for it. So gotcha. I'm a little bit up the creek. Hmm. I want you guys to be able to see this. I wish I had a marker board. Marker board would work too. Yeah. Let's see what else I got here. I know there's sometimes just little cheap drawing programs in here, right? I think they based Should I try that one? All right. <laughs> Let's see. It's gonna let me drop my finger. All right. Yay, okay. I'll be able to, this will work. Except can I undo here? I'll see the eraser. When I need a race, I'll erase. Okay, so um, drawing exercises I usually like to start with, you can literally just put a dot, you know, two dots, and you kind of move your, your finger back and forth between the two, and you create a straight line. It's not going to look super pretty here, but you can literally just go down the page and do straight lines. And I used to spend just like half an hour doing this, just, just practicing drawing straight lines. Um, in which it kind of helps too if you're on a table where you can you can have your elbow on the table, <laughs> kind of lock it down a little bit. Um, mine aren't going to be the prettiest here, but you know that's the basic idea with that. You start with doing straight lines. That's that's level one. Level two is ellipses, practicing ellipses, and I'm I'm naturally not very good at ellipses. I've do, I've done this, I've done this practice before. And I show my wife, and she's like, oh, that's fun. And she starts doing them, doing all these like, perfect ellipses. So some people are just really naturally inclined to doing this. And ellipses are just like circles and like squish circles. So you can practice drawing circles. And again, you want to have, ideally, you really want to have your, your elbow locked down um, when you're doing these. These are going to look so bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you guys are like, oh, you're a professional artist, huh? Um, but you can just do pages and pages of these. So those are larger circles, but let me show you kind of more of, of an ellipse as we kind of flatten it out. So it's going to look more, more like that. You know, it's like the, to the top of like a, a um, top of like a soup can, right? And you can flatten them out even more. They're really flat ellipses. And then you can do this thing where you kind of like try to start start really flat and make them make them bigger. So I'll start like there, run this a little bit wider, wider. You know, and eventually you get back to a full circle. All right, but make yours look better than these. 
All right, so you do ellipses and lines. Practice those, you know. Just chill out. It's like it's like meditating. You just that's all you're doing is you're just focusing on doing these and making them as, as good as possible. Um, and then once you focus on those, you can start building shapes out of the lines. So this is kind of where it gets really fun, where you can start building. Um, so you do your straight lines, kind of do three in the same direction. And you can start doing something like building a cube. So I've got this line here, and I'm going to do a parallel line to that. And then going the other way, line going that way, and a parallel line to that. And then I got these two, I'll do a third one parallel to that, and again, let's see, these two, this one, this one. Oh, you can't see where I'm pointing, I forget. You start doing things like building cubes. Um, and then you want to think about these cubes, turning them in space. You'd be like, okay, what if I have a cube that's kind of facing towards me? What would that look like? Um, they don't have to be perfect, but... And you can start thinking about doing them with a little bit more um, perspective as well. So let's say I've got a vanishing point somewhere over here, even though it doesn't need to be right over there. I've got three lines that are kind of pointing in that direction. And I can kind of make this into a cube too. So um, just got to make parallel lines, the different sides. Got like this one's kind of more rectangular, but that's the idea. So there's another one where you can just fill like fill like a page of cubes. <coughs> a few more of those, more exercises. Another fun thing you can start doing once you do these cubes is um, I'm gonna do a cube here. So it's important to point out just. Um, to make it clear, cubes are always made of um, lines going in three directions. So you're always going to have these three are going to be parallel. Or if or if, if there's perspective, they'll be going towards a vanishing point. You have these three; they'll be more or less parallel. And then these three that are parallel. So you kind of just need to look at, at that. Once you draw a line, then you use that as as your um, your starting point for, for doing the next line. Okay, now it's going to show an exercise. You can also do this once you start doing cubes. Do a cube. And you can like fit ellipses inside the faces of the cube. Something like that. Okay. And once you learn ellipses, then you can start building cylinders. So you have an ellipse, this one's easy. Two lines on the side, another ellipse. If you want, you can erase that. You got a little, little soup can. And it's the same thing, you can kind of think about turning them in space. Make a little more of the ellipse facing towards me. Another one there, so it's kind of pretending like this thing is kind of turning down, facing towards us. Eventually it might face directly at us. Let's try to draw a little bit more clearly. start out with those basic shapes and once you know how to do um, cylinders and once you know how to do cubes and you can stretch cubes and squish cubes uh, you can start building really anything um, and you just got to start adding detail onto that so I could do like for example um, variation on a cube and it starts to become the beginning of like something like a car You guys are so impressed right now, I'm sure. <laughs> but once you start doing that too, then you can start thinking about perspective as well, and you can put those, those cubes into perspective. Another really great exercise is, is doing a perspective grid. A lot of people, when they first learn perspective, they do something like this. Oh, I got a vanishing point, and stuff goes to the vanishing point. But real life doesn't really look like that as often. I like to create a ground plane with my perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do like a bunch of parallel lines on the ground like that. Now I'm going to do some parallel, some lines going the opposite direction. That's what I'm going to use for my perspective. 
and then I can build a cube, and build a cube on top of that grid. I'm gonna do a different color so I can stands up a little better. Oops. See in that now we have that grid that tells us how we're gonna make this cube. So those those different lines need to line up, those different sides need to line up with that. And I can create a whole scene with this. Put people in here. You know, someone walking between two cubes for some reason. Or this could be this could be like Godzilla, you know, coming through the city here. And those become the tools that, that you can use to build anything. And this really becomes the key when you start when you start doing work that's like from your imagination. Um, you know, these are the tools you need to use. You, you have to build up those scenes, you know, piece by piece. Start with perspective, you know, put those pieces in there, put the, the cubes and cylinders so you can build things up. Put a little uh, water tower on here. So like if you're interested in, in, in doing this work, kind of the next step then is like you want to start studying other images. And so another exercise I really love to do, I wish I could do an example of it here, but I don't really have the, the tools to do it, is I, I like to find other pieces of art, other photographs, clips from movies, and I bring them into a, a tool like Photoshop, and I'll draw a pers perspective grid over the top of it. Be like, okay, here's the perspectives, here's the vanishing points, if they're figures, Sometimes I'll like draw cubes around the figures, so I can be like, actually, I, I think I do have an example of this, and I can find my, I'll, I'll put my fingers forward and show you guys this. figure sitting here and it's really interesting because there's this, this implied vanishing point even with how he's, he's the characters are sitting they all kind of line up their shoulders are all, all kind of line up into this vanishing point in this grid so anyway that is that's the basic idea of of using simple shapes um, to learn how to draw so if you guys have any questions on that anything else I can kind of demonstrate along those lines Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, uh, when I first started learning art, I would get frustrated with myself really quickly. Um, I would say, at what point does it feel fun for you? Like, do you find like just the exercise is enjoyable, or <laughs> at what point does it feel fun? Mm -hmm. uh, like ten years ago, it was fun. Um, 
I mean, the thing is, you, it, that changes too, and at some point it is a job, and I've, I've spent more time not enjoying drawing than I have spent enjoying drawing, you know, because a lot of times you're just like, I gotta get this done, because I got a deadline. Um, but there, there, is, there is definitely a point at which you feel like a certain amount of mastery with it. And there, there's fun, fun comes at different levels, so it's like, you start doing an exercise like this, and it's gonna be super frustrating, you know, and that's easy at that point to be like, uh, I can't do this, forget about it, and then throw it aside. But the, the kind of first fun that you're gonna hit is when you stick with it. Let's say you do it for a couple weeks every day for like half an hour, and you hit that point where you're like, oh, I'm getting better. Like, that's a fantastic feeling. And that's kind of what I have to say is like, that's kind of the benefits of being a, be a beginner as an artist. Because if, if you're a beginner as an artist, if you put a little bit of like dedicated time in, you're gonna start seeing yourself grow very quickly. You know, and that's really fun. When the, the first time when you see yourself start growing, that's really exciting. So there's that, but then there starts to be kind of just over time, there's just this very, very long process of, of getting better. And so you're gonna, you're gonna have this like hump where you're gonna get, get good really fast, and that's gonna kind of plateau for, for quite a while. Um, and then it's fun, you have kind of more of these moments in the plateau where you'll just be working and you'll just suddenly realize like, oh geez, I'm doing stuff that I would have like, would have blown my, blown me away like 10 years ago. You know, just kind of realize that randomly at certain moments. So you go back and look at your old sketchbook and you're like, oh my gosh, I've like, I've grown so much like at this time since, since I've been going. But I'm also at this point now as an artist where I finally feel like there's also the fun of having confidence in what you can do. That I'm, I'm at the point now where there's nothing that really intimidates me as an artist. Like I can, I can look at something and be like, oh, I can do that. You know, some stuff may take me a little more work and I know I'm gonna have to like spend a little bit more time getting it right. But that's a really cool feeling to be at a place to just know like, oh yeah, I know that I'm gonna be able to do something and it's, and it's gonna, even if I don't like bust my butt working on it, I know it's gonna be something that's gonna have kind of a good result. So lots of different types of fun I, I think that can that path, so. You guys can also ask, if you want to ask me any questions about kind of my career, how I, how I you know, got started as an artist or whatever. Um, I should also mention I have, I have a YouTube channel that a lot of kind of ideas I shared here are little pieces from that YouTube channel that I've kind of like stitched together and I talk a lot about how I make art, my, my theories about making art, philosophy, and I do demonstrations too. Yeah. Uh, major influences in your life? As far as artists or teachers or whatever? Um, as far as artists and teachers, um, you know, uh, there's like a lot, and that like changes all the time. But, um, you know, a lot of the same stuff other people would say, you know, things like, like Jim Henson. But I also, one of my, my favorite um, initial comics I really liked was Judge Dredd. That was like the first thing that I picked up. A lot of the, the standard like image comic stuff when I was in junior high was super, super big. You know, later, like out of college, when I was trying to like get more serious, it was more like Jeff Smith and Frank Cho. Um, but then, like discovering Guy Davis was like a really great thing. So I was like, oh man, he has he's so loose. There's so much energy in his work. Um, but those influences change all the time. I love Miyazaki. Uh, his Nausicaa manga, I think, is my favorite comic book of all time. Um, so lots of different things. And then like meeting, you meet people in real life and become friends with other artists in real life. And you're like, oh my gosh, here's this real person who's doing this amazing stuff. And you're like, oh, okay, I can, I can, he can do this, I can do this. And then you realize, well, you can't actually do everything he does, but you know, you can be better at what you do, you know. So, but that continues, continues to change. I'm always finding new stuff that I'm like, wow, like this person's doing. And I kind of feel like I can go through my, my comic, like if I go through my book, Green Monk, I can show on every page, like, oh, I was reading, this time I was reading uh, Tetsuro Oyama because I was kind of trying to rebuff what he was doing here. And this one is more like, uh, like I was, I was reading Curse Pirate Girl when I did this, because I can see I'm trying to do all this, this stuff here that looks like that. Um, so I think that's important too as an artist, you just constantly like, like find you know, different inspiration. Would you say it's harder for you to start or to finish a work, and how do you push through that? That is a great question. <laughs> There's actually another another uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi quote that I was going to use, and he says, and this is about the practice of meditation, but he said, I think it applies to art too. And he says, the secret is to start and keep going. You know, <laughs> like that's that's the secret to making art. 
starting is definitely a challenge. Like there's an art just to starting, and there's 80% of people fail because they don't start. You know, if you can just like decide on a project, and whether it's a mini comic or something, I like to refer people to like my first mini comic I did, which was Green Monk, because I was like, I'm gonna do a, a small project, I'm gonna make it as simple as possible, and I'm, I'm just gonna work on it every day till it's done. Um, but I think um, thinking about things with, with more of like a, a practice mindset, like in terms of like, this is where like spiritual ideas and, and religion come in again. This idea that like you have this spiritual practice, you do something every day. If you treat art like that, like okay, the thing I do every day is I draw. And if you just draw every day, eventually that's you're going to finish things if, if you kind of make that commitment. And that was the experience I had with, with my first Green Monk book. I just said, like, okay, I'm just going to work on this every day. I worked on it every single day, and eventually it was done. So I'm very much of the mindset of, um, you know, goals are important, but again, we talk about priorities. I feel like we need to put, like, process and practice before goals. Like, focus on, like, some sort of regular practice, and then goals can support that, that regular practice. Um, yeah, there's another question. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you went to film school. So how did uh, a background in film translate to comic book writing? And so when did you make that shift? Uh, that shift? Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, I've always been like very ADD with my interests. Like I wanted to do animation at one time. I wanted to do, um, you know, comics at one time. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna have a band. Cause like, oh, I wanna like, um, you know, press girls, but I was a ska band, so that didn't work at all. Um, and then, you know, I decided like, oh, I'm gonna make movies. And so I did film school. And, um, you know, I left film school, and this is actually that first slide I showed where I was just like miserable. That was like, I was still like trying to figure out, oh, I, I wanna make movies, you know? And um, it was very much like, my ego was very much involved with it. Where it's like, oh yeah, I wanna, I wanna like show everyone like that I'm, totally kick everyone's butt and make like really great art and stuff and I was very wrapped up in that and you know working with my therapist and kind of reading some of these books I mentioned uh, we had this discussion and he was like okay what what really matters to you um, like what what story of all these stories you want to tell and I had like five different scripts I was trying to write, trying to write and all these different comics I wanted to write he said like which one matters to you most which one is most important to you and one thing that was really helpful to me at this time was having read Jack Kornfield's A Path with Heart. And he has this thing he does at the beginning that's called like the, uh, the deathbed uh, meditation, which I totally recommend people doing if you're trying to figure out what to do with your life. And it's basically this idea that you imagine yourself like on your deathbed and like thinking back on your life and thinking like, what do I want to be able to say about my life? You know, in that moment where I'm getting ready to die and just kind of realizing, well, I want to do something I'm proud of, and I would like it to be something like this. I'd like it to be something good that I feel like is not just some some marketing product. And so going through that process and kind of talking with my therapist, I was like, okay, there's this comic I want to do. This is what feels the best to me. It feels like most true to, to who I am. And so I said, I'm going to do this comic. I'm going to push all this film stuff to the side. I focused on that, and when I was done, I was like, Okay, comics. I'm doing comics. You know, um, so it's, I think having those priorities is, really helps to kind of clear away that clutter um, and kind of get away from this whole like. Again, I was talking about like how status can affect us so much, and like like ego can affect us a lot. There was very much this part of me that was like, I want to be an artist, but I also want to show that I can make a lot of money being an artist, or that I can do really impressive stuff as an artist, so I can impress all these people that aren't artists. Because the standard of, of the rest of the world is like, you know, being having success in this in this financial way. So a lot of times we mix we kind of get confused with what our goals are with art, what we want from art, and kind of these materialistic aspirations as well. I think we really kind of need to like separate those. So that was a long answer to the question. But <laughs> oh, but it also I mean it definitely informs me in terms of I, I just studied a lot of storytelling as you know in film and there's film that still has a very visual aspect. Um, but it was actually kind of a big leap to learn that that, that um, comics tell stories in, in a different way. And so it's easy to think about comics as just like, oh, I've got a storyboard, 
you know, in a book, but comics are actually a very different thing. And so that was actually a big hurdle to understand that, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not making a movie in a, in a comic. I'm actually, it's actually its own medium. So, anything else? Go ahead. Can we have one more question? Cool. Well, thanks for letting me ramble and draw with my finger today, guys. So I'm going to be out here. Thanks, guys.